was the summer of 2014, and for my son's bar mitzvah present, just like many Jewish parents, we wanted him to bond with the Holy Land. Oh, it worked perhaps too well. My husband had stayed back at the hotel, and our friends, my son and I, had just stopped in a pharmacy. Run! Run to the bomb shelter, sweetie! Please! Please hurry! I didn't hear the sirens at first, but the Israelis did. They're used to hearing these things. We ran to the back of the storeroom. It was a 12 foot by 24 foot windowless bomb shelter. My heart's pounding. Boom! Boom! I hear and feel the percussion of the exploding bombs. I'm trying not to get sick. I look at my 13-year-old son and I think I'll never forgive myself if something happens to him. That's an excerpt from a speech I gave to the Orange County Jewish Bar Association. It was the first but not the last time we had to run to a bomb shelter. Our adventure and my transformation is also the subject of my book, Blasted from Complacency, A Journey from Terror to Transformation in Israel. There is no chapter in a parenting book on what to do when a war starts and you're on a family vacation. Think touring extraordinary and sacred sites mixed with cowering in bomb shelters. I'm still trying to get over the Jewish guilt of taking my son to war for his bar mitzvah present. The impact of being human targets helped me understand the plight of Israelis living like this, and it also made me want to work on peace. How Israel is often described on the news is not what I'd seen with my own eyes, and I felt Palestinian parents also preferred their children playing safely in their backyards. The missiles exploded just near enough to blow apart my world as I knew it, forever changing me, and you'd never recognize my life today with what it was like then. I believe I found my life's purpose. Hello and welcome everyone to Peace with Penny. I'm excited to be having Professor Mohammed Estajani Dawoodi and talk with so many peacemakers. I love good news, don't you? Even if it's one small step at a time, at least it's going in the right direction. We've talked to Israelis, Palestinians, and others, all of them working at the grassroots level on peace, most often between Israelis and Palestinians. For me, it's been a true honor to hear their stories and to know that there are people working so hard to make their lives on the ground better. It takes lots of effort, but if the result is people living with a bit less stress peacefully amongst one another, it's definitely worth it. Please remember, if you missed any of the episodes, they're on my website at pennyst.com under podcasts. Today, we're changing things up, and we're recording a special 90-minute episode of Peace with Penny in cooperation with Unity is Strength, a United Religions Initiative Cooperation Circle on Quora. I'm going to be interviewing Professor Dijani, and afterwards you'll have the opportunity to ask Professor Dijani questions for a full 30 minutes. Professor Dijani is a Jerusalem-born Palestinian who went from being a student activist and a member of Fatah fighting for Palestinian liberation during the 1960s to being a peace activist. He founded the Wasatia Movement of Modern Islam, an organization that spreads the message of understanding, tolerance, coexistence, and brotherhood. Interestingly, he can trace back his family lineage in Jerusalem for over 400 years. His family were the custodians of King David's tomb. From 2001 to 2014, he worked at El Quds University. He gained notoriety when in 2014, Professor Dijani took 27 of his students to Auschwitz. When his trip was written about in the newspaper and mistranslated into Arabic, he was vilified as a traitor and collaborator by Palestinians. Threatened with death threats, in 2015, his car was torched in front of his house. He believes that was actually a failed attempt on his life. In our Peace with Penny podcast, we'll talk about his change of heart towards Israelis, his work against Holocaust deniers, and his other peace activities through the years for which 
He has paid dearly in both his career and personally. My intention, uh, Professor, is to talk to you first about when you were young and growing up in Jerusalem, specific events in your past, and hopefully we can talk about some current issues today as well. And then we'll transition into asking questions that our audience submitted before the interview. You were born a couple of years before Israel became a state. Tell us what it was like growing up as a Palestinian in Jerusalem at that time. What were the views about Israel from your Palestinian family and neighbors? Well, it is um, my family um, is a well-known uh, Jerusalemite family that has roots in the city. And uh, then it was the aristocracy of the Palestinians living in Jerusalem used to live in West Jerusalem. And then when the war took place and the Israeli, the Jewish forces took over uh, West Jerusalem, then um, most of them had to flee to East Jerusalem, leaving behind their property. So my grandfather and our family were part of it. Uh, during 1947-48, during that period, when the conflict became very violent, my grandfather decided to send his uh, wife and his daughter and daughters and son, and us included, my father, my mother, and my daughter and myself, uh, to uh, uh, Egypt where his brother used to have a supermarket. And uh, so we left to Egypt uh, from West Jerusalem. But when we came back, we came back to East Jerusalem, leaving everything behind. And so that was, uh, left a lot of impact on the family. And um, for quite some time, it was very difficult to uh, to erase the memories of the past. And uh, I remember growing up in the old city and, uh, uh, you know, everything there was around the loss of the homeland and uh, anger at it. So Palestinians put their faith in the Arab countries that they would uh, regain their homeland for them. And, but what I learned is from the stamina of my grandfather, because he was a merchant in uh, West Jerusalem and in Palestine in general, and a very well-known merchant who would import from different European countries. And um, at the same time, uh, he was a distributor of, uh, of goods. So leaving everything behind. Uh, it's very interesting that the night he left, that um, he was going in the morning uh, to the uh, to his stores. And then his neighbor told him, Abu Sliman, can you please uh, give me, uh, bring me from the market meat? And he said, I have meat in my uh, fridge. I'll get it to you and then I'll buy for myself. He got at the meat, but he never came back to the house that day because that day this, the Jewish forces took over that uh, that part of the city. So he had he his brothers his, his all the the Jani family had to leave from West Jerusalem to East Jerusalem. So and then we came back from Egypt and. Uh, uh, also, another story that left an impact is that my grandmother, our house was next to the Anirwa office. And my grandmother, her, neighbor, her friends told her, why don't you go register in the Anirwa office as a refugee in order to get uh, monthly supplies and, and things. And so she did. And she came back very proud that she is helping the family, bringing with her food and the clothes and money and 
they used to distribute some money and uh, some clothes, some food. And my grandfather came from his, uh, from his shop and found all that, asked her from where it is. She said, uh, we, I have registered as a refugee. So he took the car, tore it, and said, I'm not a refugee. Take back all this, and I don't want you to even mention this again. It taught us something. It taught us that being a refugee is a mindset. If you decide to be a refugee, you can. But if you do decide not to be and to start all over again, then you can also. He was the second. Uh, he was of the second time in the sense that he started all over again. The old city did not have electricity. So he got a generator and started selling electricity to the, to the people. And eventually, it ended up to be the Jerusalem Electric uh, Company. And uh, he didn't, uh, he knew nothing about hospitality. And he found this building that was uh, uh, the imperial, that he did into renovate into becoming the Imperial Hotel. It used to be built in 1885. And, uh, but it was run down by the war and people have occupied the building. So he renovated it, went to Damascus, got uh, all furniture for it and made it a first class hotel. And so this is the stories that keep us going because we feel we should walk into his footsteps at the same time, he was the one who opened the gate from uh, uh, Jaffa Gate to Moroccan Gate because uh, it was blocked. So he convinced the municipality of Jordan, became a member of the municipality, and convinced them to start a road there. And they did get money from Jordan and they did build the road. So people, tourists, started to come to Jaffa Gate through that road through the taxis, while before they used to come to the Damascus Gate and uh, walk all the way to Jaffa Gate with uh, the su their suitcases on donkeys. And so uh, things, stories like that, I remember very well uh, that uh, gave us insights about how, what to do. When you are down, don't sit there and cry but stand up and move on. And you, at one time you ended up in Lebanon. Could you talk how you ended up there and, and what happened? Yeah, I, um, uh, I studied at an American school, the Friends Girls School and the Friends Boys School for 12 years. Then graduated from there and um, applied for the uh, for the American University of Beirut. And uh, in 1964, I was admitted and I wanted to study engineering. So for the first, between 64 and 70 and 67, I studied engineering. And then in 67, the war did take place. And um, to me, it was uh, a catastrophe that because uh, of the loss of hope before that, we, I joined the Arab nationalist movement because their motto was Arab unity would lead to liberation. And so I joined it because we wanted to liberate Palestine. And then in 67, we woke up that uh, this was a dream that uh, the Arab armies will not unite. And even if they unite, they don't have what it takes to win a war. So. Uh, we were inspired by Vietnam, by the, by the Chinese model of uh, guerrilla warfare. And that's why I joined Fatah. Fatah started in 65. I, during 65, 67, we did not believe in uh, armed struggle, uh, guerrilla warfare. And so 67, uh, when the Arab armies failed, we uh, joined. I joined it and then in 68 when the Karame battle took place and the uh, Israeli army uh, was uh, beaten during that period 
uh, in that battle in particular because of the combination of the Palestinian and Jordanian. So the armed struggle uh, boomed in the Arab world and then it became extremely popular and funds started to pour in. And um, I stayed with that till 75. I got military training and what they found because I was at the American University of Beirut and I spoke English, so they found they can use me in public relations better than uh, because so many people they had in military training, they did not need money, uh, that, that many. And so I worked with public relations. However, by, 60, by 75, I think I, uh, lost, uh, I lost hope that anything can be achieved with armed struggle. So I decided to, uh, to leave. To the, first, I went to England and then second to the United States, where in England I joined the University of Loughborough to do my PhD. But then my brother was doing his MA uh, in East Michigan in the United States. So he asked me to go visit. So I went to visit and then what was 10 day visit uh, uh, became 10 years visit. <laughs> and I studied there first my MA at Eastern Michigan, and then my uh, first PhD at University of South Carolina. And then when I finished, I needed to decide what to do because I needed either I will be married, I'll get married to get a residency or do another PhD. So I did another PhD. And, uh, but by the time I finished my second PhD, my father managed to get a pardon from King Hussein for me to go back to Jordan, which I did. Then in 1993, he managed to get me also another pardon from Israel to go back to Israel on a family reunion. And that's when I came back to Israel in 1993 for the first time after the uh, 1967 war. And but during that period, I, I uh, moved from, and I was, uh, the tra Palestinian traveler, like the <laughs> Jewish traveler before him, uh, from Lebanon to England to the United States, back to Jordan, back to Jerusalem. And you live in Jerusalem today, correct? My family never left Jerusalem, that's yes. why. Yes. So during this time, how would you say that your people consider what 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 we might call terrorism? How how did how how do the Palestinian people regard uh, that you know they they call themselves freedom fighters? Can you explain to us um, how Palestinians regard what they're doing? Uh, as freedom fighters? Well, um, after 6 7, because the Arab morale was very low, and Palestinian also morale was extremely low, and uh, now they lost also the West Bank. Uh, the Arabs lost Golan Heights, Sinai, and so to them, uh, anything they clung to hope in order to fight Israel. And so the Palestinian commandos became extremely popular within the Arab world and uh, within uh, the among the Palestinian people. And you will find that they tended to join uh, the uh, different commando models. And the Arab countries also started to establish their own commando models. Iraq had its own commando organization, uh, Syria, um, others in Libya also financed uh, its own. So uh, more than 50 organizations just mushrooms. But among them, the uh, Fatah was the leader and uh, the PFLT did uh, a number of military operations with hijacking of flights and things that 
also got a name for it. For it. Um, so it was, yeah, it was uh, uh, then yeah, the model was uh, Vietnam and uh, China and uh, Algeria and so so that was uh, the model they used. Yeah. What I'm trying to understand because you have uh, going through all of this, you certainly had one set of outlook and we'll get to how you think today, but I, I just wanted to establish uh, you're comfortable with this, you're you know, working with the gorillas, you're helping train yeah, yeah, yeah. people. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was the best year of my life. Because? I felt, I felt uh, uh, in the comradeship, the comradeship with people. We were living all as one. We believed in the cause and uh, and we, we were ideally, not all of us, that's the reason I mean. It was a struggle between the idealist and the one who is exploiting the uh, revolution. And so to us, we were living in idealism. And uh, so, and then thinking about liberation, it was, we, were, we never thought in terms of annihilation but we thought in terms of a democratic state for Jews, Christians, Muslims living together. So that was the, that was the, the goal, and to, to establish a democratic state where Muslims, Jews, and Christians can live together and to end the Zionist entity of Israel. And so, but to us, it was us or them, the win lose uh, battle and it wasn't we were, we were not thinking in terms of compromise or in terms of peace with israel or in terms of negotiation that's why the, uh, the khartoum summit with its three no's no to recognition no to peace with israel and no to uh, negotiation so that was uh, at that time, during that period, that was the paradigm for every, in the Arab world, in all the Arab world. So, and to achieve that, the Palestinian community was supposed to lead the way to the liberation of Palestine from the Zionist entity, which was thought as a dagger in the heart of the Arab world, as an imperialist state, and um, the popular books that the time also that uh, that was most popular were the um, protocols of the end elders of Zion. You can see it reprinted. Right. Uh, my counselor Hitler, my struggle, and, or and a lot, or or uh, the Vietnamese experience, the gorilla experience, the Wara, the leaders also were coming from uh, all of them from the armed struggle, bit, particularly also in uh, the armed struggle national, nationalist movement were spreading in the Arab world, particularly in Africa. Uh, so I mean, that was in that, during that period for the 50s and the 60s, that was uh, the apex of uh, political rhetoric that you cannot you cannot uh, speak about uh, peace or reconciliation. I mean, no way you can. Right. You, not, and you cannot be accepted within that. Yeah, there. You mentioned uh, a time period of, of that you were looking for democracy and 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 all that. Uh, when you were talking about yeah, this, I got a little confused because I don't believe that was during this time period, correct? No, no, no. What happened is that um, when I was in Lebanon, we talked about democracy, but there was no democracy. We talked about uh, a lot of uh, slogans, but in reality, 
we never knew what it means. Mm -hmm. So to us, democracy at that time is authoritarianism or dictatorship, but we called it democracy. Uh -huh. So yani within that cave, you live uh, seeing uh, images and believing they are the reality. So I was lucky that I had the opportunity to leave uh, this cave and go to, to, to the West, go to the United States and spend 10 years in the United States learning about democracy and, and, and experiencing democracy and watching and uh, living and, uh, and teaching it and in the American experience and, and all that. So to me, it was a, an eye opener. It was, uh, I moved from a, a closed minded set to an open minded set. And so within, within the United States, I was able, although during that period, I didn't get involved in any Palestinian activities, but yet I was able to study the American experience and the democratic culture and so how different it is from my perceptions of what it is. And this is where you know, uh, uh, being in the United States was uh, finding you know, it is totally new knowledge. And then the good thing about studying in the United States is that uh, you can hear both sides of the story. And uh, so to me, it was uh, very, very important. Uh, so that's where, when I came back to Jordan, I established the uh, Department of Political Science at Applied Science University and started to, uh, I was the one who set the courses for the program. So all, all of my references was from the United States and not from the Arab world. The same thing happened when I came to, to, uh, to Jerusalem and I established the American studies in, two, in 2002. I, I, uh, the idea was build bridges between the Arab culture and the American culture. And so, and this is where I met the Israeli culture. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was shocking for me really to be able to uh, delve into the Israeli culture because I never expected that. I came from a culture that saw the enemy in the Israeli. And so there is no way to deal with the Israeli as a Zionist. And that unless he um, uh, clears his mind of Zionism, and there is no way you can reach out. And that is, we made a total distinction between Zionism and Judaism. So Judaism is a religion and Zionism is a political entity. And so that's where we could live with the idea of uh, a secular, uh, secular uh, state where Muslims, Christians, and Jews can live together. So okay. it was to dismantle Sorry. Israel and bring back Judaism as a religion rather than as a nationality or okay. as Sorry, go ahead. Go so ahead. Uh, ultimately, you actually have shockingly with all of this background <laughs> changed your attitude uh, uh, toward yeah, because... Israelis. And, and I'd, I'd love for you to tell the story of, of what, what how, how that came to be, because that's a significant shift in, in everything you believed in. Yeah. Uh, coming back to Israel in 1993, when I crossed the bridge, it was a total uh, experience, uh, shocking experience, because this is the first time I would be uh, meeting Israelis as Israelis. When I was in the States, I used to uh, teach in South Carolina uh, Arabic. And um, next to my office was an Israeli teaching Hebrew. We never spoke to each other. We never crossed, you know, we will come across each other, but we, not, we were 
teachers in the same department, but I socialized with every uh, other teacher except him. And he socialized with every other teacher except me. And so to us, the wall divided us, but it is hundreds of years of enmity that also divided us. So to me coming with this baggage and crossing the bridge and seeing soldiers and seeing, you know, it was uh, a totally different experience. Uh, for me. So the minute I walked in, I thought that they will uh, go go back on their uh, permit to allow me in and imprison me. They didn't. So to me, that was my first shock, my first shock because yeah. I expected to be in prison and that they just uh, made it a plot to get me back because for 10 years, my father was trying to get me back and they will tell him his files are so high, we will need years to read them. Uh, and that's where it was hopeless for me to come back. But yet, eventually in 1993, I, I was able to come back. And so this is my first shot. And then when I came home, uh, it was a totally different world because when I left in 67, there was not a single house near our house. I come back and I rarely see my house because of all the houses. And then I locked myself in the house. Although I used to work as a, you know, between, between 1993 and 1995, when I used to come back from Jordan, uh, I avoided to meet Israelis. I avoided to visit Israeli cities. I avoided to go to shopping malls. I avoided restaurants. So that to me, it was uh, a period where it was difficult for me to, uh, to meet the other. Yet I was forced to go with my father to Ankarim hospital to drive him there because after his chemotherapy, he had cancer. And after his chemotherapy, he needed someone to drive him back. So he was, I, and there is no way I could have said no to that. So I drove him there and then waited for him. In the beginning, I used to wait in the car. And then he says, why don't you go in and take coffee? And then I started going in to take a, coffee, a cup of coffee while he, and then I went with him. And so that's where I started to notice that um, the, the doctors, the nurses are not treating him as a Muslim, as an Arab, as a Palestinian, but as a patient. And he would make jokes with them and he will bring fruits or chocolate to the nurses. And he was a very social uh, person. And so, and he, and he had made friendships with the doctors and he, they treat him very well. And at the same time, I noticed that there were Palestinians also in the hospital that uh, were being, uh, uh, that they were receiving healthcare. So to me, that human side of the other, I never experienced. So this is a first hand experience for me. And so it helped me to demonize, to end the demonization of the other and to end the, uh, uh, demystification of the other and the stereotyping of the other and this block this this thing itself and from there I started to attend uh, uh, second what they used to call second track peace negotiations and uh, in which we we will go and meet uh, Israelis in uh, in Antalya in Ankara in uh, Nicosia in Athens in Paris and London and uh, to meet with them on different issues. So I started that. So also that was uh, important for me, the dialogue to meet them as, as a people. And then I had a few years later, I had another experience with my mother mm -hmm. where uh, it was a Friday morning and she, she, uh, Friday afternoon and she asked us if we, if we could take her to Tel Aviv to walk on the beach. And so we, uh, myself, my, 
brother and my niece, we um, drove to, and her, we drove to Tel Aviv, had dinner in, in a restaurant in what they call the opera building. And, um, and then I went with my niece walking on the beach and then came back to find uh, my mother was having a, an asthma attack. And she had two inhalers mm -hmm. with her, but they were empty. So mm. underestimating her, what is her condition, we thought that we maybe can drive back to Jerusalem where she can have her inhaler. And, uh, but then uh, once we started driving, it was Shabbat and uh, we assumed that everything is closed. And so we didn't think of going to try to, have, to find a pharmacy. But, but by the time we were on the highway, she started to have a heart attack and she fainted. Mm. So the only thing my brother was driving, the only thing he could do was, he found the exit to the Ben Gurion airport and uh, he just took that exit. And I was shocked, I told him, we don't have time because you know, to go there, waste our time. And, uh, but he, he said, we have no choice. She, she has fainted and it's too late for us to take her all the way to Jerusalem. So we drove to the airport and once we got to the gate, we told the soldiers that we have a sick woman with us, can you help? And immediately they were very positive. Immediately they vacated one of the gates and called in an emergency uh, health uh, unit. And they came and uh, then they started to resuscitate my mother for more than half an hour. And uh, eventually they, they found a pulse and decided to take her to a military hospital. They asked for permission to the Sarafan military hospital near the airport. So they drove her there. We followed them. And by the time we got there, um, we waited for two hours. And then uh, a doctor came and told us that your mother died on arrival. And Aye. we were we said, we have been waiting here for two hours. Uh, why didn't you tell us? And he said, we were afraid of your reaction. So we said, no, we appreciate all the work that you have done for her. And so eventually we, we went and uh, we couldn't take her with us because it was Shabbat and they couldn't uh, give us an ambulance to take her back. So we draw, he, he said, they said for that we should come the next day, which we, which we did and to pick her up. And, but on our way back, I was uh, looking at her empty seat and thinking about the vacuum she has left uh, and that she would leave also with our family and with us. But at the same time, I was thinking about my enemy who, who gave her all they could in order to help her. And so that uh, was an awakening moment for me. So that's where I believe from you know, these personal experiences, I believe I transformed from what you may call heart of uh, stone to heart of flesh and uh, started believing in peace and reconciliation and that we can live together and we can share the land. And we, all we have to do is look at each other and uh, see the humanity in the other, whether we as Palestinians or the other as the Israelis. And if they could look also at us and see the humanity there, rather than the stereotype image of a terrorist, or us, the stereotype image of a soldier on the checkpoints and uh, or the jailer or whatever. You have, you know, so many interesting parts to uh, your experiences. It was uh, a Friday morning and um, it was uh, Ramadan and um, and so we uh, uh, I, our house here overlooks uh, the Israel the, what used to be the Israeli checkpoint separating the West Bank and Jerusalem and so it was a Friday morning and I was observing from uh, from my window actually from this window over to the checkpoint. And 
hundreds of Palestinians have been pushing against the checkpoint to go to Jerusalem to pray in Al Haram because they believe in Ramadan it is a it's a very big blessing for them to pray at Al Haram. So that's why they wanted to go. But the Israelis were forbidding them to cross because they didn't have permits to to go from Palestine to Israel or Palestinian territories to Israel. And so uh, what uh, what happened is that the Israelis were pushing them back and throwing at them tear gas. I was very far, yet my I couldn't open my eyes because of the intensity of the tear gas. Yet they were adamant, they would not uh, uh, move and they were pushing against the soldiers. And the soldiers uh, used uh, horses and uh, tear gas and jeeps. And so I thought eventually they will shoot them and uh, shoot at them and uh, it will be a big media event. However, after a while I noticed that the uh, uh, soldiers, uh, the officers at the, at the checkpoint made a deal with the people in which the soldiers brought, they, the Israelis brought buses and then allowed the people to go through the checkpoint. They checked them for weapons and they didn't find any. So they took their IDs and then the buses took them to Jerusalem to pray. After prayer, the buses brought them back to the checkpoint and then they got their IDs and went home. Every Friday that happened. So uh, to me, it was uh, also an inspiring moment because I said, this is a win-win situation in game theory. Um, the Israelis worried about security, nothing happened. The Palestinians worried about missing prayers at the Haram Sharif, they were able to pray. And so both of them got what they wanted. So it was a win-win situation. I thought these people are not Hamas. They are not uh, uh, belong. They don't belong to any of the radical Islamic parties. We have ten of them in Palestine, and we have thirty secular parties that don't work with, don't deal with religion. So I thought I will to uh, and this uh, incident inspired me to start what I called a wasatiya an Islamic moderate movement uh, that calls for moderation and peace with Israel because the Hamas and the other Islamic uh, parties uh, don't want peace with Israel. And they feel that they believe that this is endowment, the land of Palestine, and it is not non-negotiable. And as a result, it is, uh, we fight against the Jews uh, until uh, doomsday. And so to them, that's their uh, mentality. And so I thought to start a movement, an Islamic movement that will, will find the medium in the middle. And so it will attract the um, uh, seculars. At the same time, it will attract the moderates who are Muslim. And that's how we started the movement. I published a, and then 10 books about it. And uh, we, st we, st we used to have every year a conference in which sheikhs, imams used to more than 200, used to meet for 10 years. And uh, so as a result of this, I used the Quran because I did not want them to say that this is a Western idea because already they used the, on Facebook, they put my, my photo and put an X on it. And they said the journey got $42 million from the CIA in order to promote uh, Western American Islam. And so that's how we, start, how we started. But yet I thought we should continue despite all this and uh, try to promote moderation within the Palestinians, but using the Quran, using religious language. That's why we use the verse in the second chapter of the Quran. It is verse 142 of Al-Baqarah Surah of the second chapter. The second chapter is made of 286 verses. Verse 142 says, and thus we have 
uh, and thus God will guide you to the right path. Verse 143 says, and God has created you a moderate nation, a temperate nation, a middle ground nation. Now, the Hamas people used to explain it to the people that there is no middle ground. We are, middle, we are when it says God created you a middle ground nation, he means that we are middle between Jews who killed their prophets and the Christians who made their prophet a God. So Islam came to replace Judaism and Christianity because these two religions went uh, astray. And so our, our uh, interpretation that this is not true, Islam did not come to replace Christianity and Judaism, but to continue in the messages that God has sent. And this is what the Quran says. And that's where we started, the, we found that there is a lot of misinterpretation with the Quran and a lot of misinterpretation with the Hadith. And so we started to actually fight against teaching radicalism within the Palestinian curriculum and also within the Palestinian community in the mosques. And so in order to uh, explain the religion to the people, not the religion that was funded by Saudi Arabia and the Ben Taymiyyah, the Wahhabi version, in which uh, negates the presence of the other. And you will never go to heaven unless you are a Muslim. And being a Muslim is adhering to it, the Islamic faith. And so that was part of the problem. So as, uh, as a Wasatiya leader, uh, I was invited by a French organization called Alaeddin in 2011 to go to Auschwitz with around 150 uh, religious leaders, all Christians, but very few Muslims from Serbia. There was the uh, Mufti of Serbia. And uh, so we were two Palestinians going. I, I brought with me the director of uh, religious affairs in the Ministry of Religious Affairs. And uh, so we went. And to me, it was, it was uh, an eye opener in all what it means. And to go there, it was February, extremely freezing. And despite all the clothes that they have given us to wear, specific, special clothes to wear, uh, it was extremely uh, cold. And then to go through the uh, Auschwitz Museum, what is now a museum, to go through the camp, through the gas chambers, through the whole, you know, the whole, uh, so to me, as someone comes from a, an environment that calls for denial and describes Auschwitz as part of the Second World War and describes the Holocaust as uh, uh, an Israeli, uh, not Israeli, it is more as a Zionist uh, story in order to elicit sympathy for Israel and support for Israel and money for Israel. So coming from that background and seeing the reality there, the only thing that I thought I was thinking about that I'm, I'm coming back and I'm coming back with, and I will tell your message. So to the victims, I made an oath and that I will tell the world what happened here, particularly my people. And so that was, and that was my vocation and I, I felt and you know, being there, seeing what has happened, I felt um, I have a responsibility to tell the story of the victims in respect to their victimhood. So that's where, uh, that's what happened. And so when the university asked me to join this trilateral project between uh, Frederick Schiller University Tel Aviv University and Bengalian University. I immediately took it. I accepted where other professors refused to do that. And because it had to do with, with the Holocaust and all that. And so that's where, I mean, that was the beginning. So we published a book, we published a book 
I was trying to find something to to give to my students, by but all the books that were written about the Holocaust in Arabic were uh, anti-Holocaust. And so we published this book with uh, two colleagues of mine uh, about the Holocaust to document exactly what has happened and show pictures in it about what has happened. So we, I started uh, inviting people to my classes to speak about the Holocaust. So we invited the uh, director of Washington Institute, Robert Sutloff, and he came and spoke and uh, showed the students in one of our classes, showed the students his film, and he talked about his book, about the righteous. And um, so uh, that was the start. And then uh, the, there was a project that I was working on in which, uh, and the idea of the project was about reconciliation, to study reconciliation, and to study the impact of empathy on reconciliation. So if you take two enemies and, and let them see the uh, suffering of the other, to what extent it will impact them to accept, to go through the path of reconciliation. So that's where 27, uh, 30 student, Israeli students from Ben Gurion University went and visited the, the Heishi camp and uh, met with Palestinian refugees from 1948. And then we took the Israel Palestinians to 30 Palestinians to Auschwitz. But before that, we, we did not announce it openly. It was uh, by word of mouth and yet we had more than, we have around 70 applicants who wanted to go. We interviewed them and picked up 30, whom we thought are mature, know English, understand, and, and, and wanting to go to learn, not as a vacation or not because they want to go out on a journey. So that was, and also they were um, graduate students. Uh, we, at that time, and the the it was the word was spread that we are going to Auschwitz, hmm. and I received an email from the president of the university, uh, telling me I heard rumors that you are going to Auschwitz. Uh, if it is true, uh, please inform your student that the university has nothing to do with it, and that uh, you are doing it. Uh, upon yourself with your Wasatiya movement. So I wrote him back saying, this is, this is how it is, you know, we are uh, going to Auschwitz uh, on behalf, you know, because the university, uh, there was the war between Gaza and uh, Israel. And so the university withdrew from all joint uh, projects with Israel. It had more than 50 joint projects with Israeli universities. And so they withdrew from them, but uh, they allowed professors who were working on these projects if they wanted to go ahead and still work to do so. But the name of the university will be withdrawn. So I said, that's fine. So my students started coming to me to tell me that uh, they are being pressured not to go. And they, they carry messages for me that I should cancel. The trip, particularly from the PA and from the and the, the other groups, uh, political groups in Palestine, and so I I said we are committed to go and we should go. Those who do not want to go because of the threats, they are welcome not to go. And two girls from Birzeit University withdrew, and one one student who was Hamas leader, we did not know at the time. But when he went to the bridge to cross, the Israelis uh, did not allow him to cross, to go to, to Jordan, to take the flight to, to Poland. And so we ended up 27 students. So to them, to the students, in the beginning, they were skeptical. But those who came with an open mind and he, uh, learned what happened.
one or two of the 27 insisted on carrying the same story. They, they, had, they came with a blocked mind. Uh, they were Fatah leaders and they did not want to understand. But the others were very receptive to, to seeing what happened and wanting to learn to the extent that one of the students who was for nine years in jail, Israeli jail, came to me asking, what does it mean to have the sign, uh, to have this sign on uh, uh, Arbeit macht frei? And then I said to her, because I usually never give them answer and ask them to go search for answers for themselves. So I told her, go find your answer. So she went and in the book, there is a bookstore there in, the, in Auschwitz. In the, so she bought a book that had uh, within it, its first pages, the photo of uh, the commander of the camp saying to the people coming in, what Dante used to say about the, in, um, in the sense that he said, all you, have, all you who enter here, abandon home because the only way out is through the chimneys of the crematorium. And so she was comparing before, in the first day, she was comparing everything there to her own prison, whether the sentries, the uh, wire bar, barbed wire, the uh, uh, prison itself, the beds. The... But now she understood that this is not a war camp because some of the Palestinians used to think that these concentration camps were, is it, were Hitler uh, brought in the Jews in order to send them to Palestine. And that there was a deal between the Zionists and the uh, Nazis to, to have the Jews come to Palestine. So mm. that was the stereotype image of uh, the Palestinians and the Arabs in general. So to them to find out that this was through the gas chambers and others, that this, is, this was a death camp. It was a totally different story. And then to see all the uh, leftovers from the people who, who died there, their glasses, their shoes, their clothes, their... so they realized that this is not a war camp. And so to them, it was an opening mind. And, but what happened is that the, the, the day before last, the, uh, when we were planning to come back, Haaretz published an article about the trip. And then a Palestinian newspaper translated that article to Arabic. And um, unfortunately, intentionally, I believe intentionally, or non-intentionally, they translated things wrong in that article. And instead of saying, the Haaretz article said that the sponsors were a German university, the article said its sponsors was Israeli universities. And the article said the funding was from DFG, which is a German research institute. And the uh, article said it was funded by Zionist organizations. The, uh, and then the, Arab, the Palestinian article for, did not uh, explain that this was a project that was reciprocal. Israeli students came and met Palestinians. So uh, it was an uproar and it was the social media picked it up and you know, within a day or two, more than 500,000 uh, messages on the internet were, uh, were there. And this is by calculation of the university uh, internet uh, uh, observe, obser, obser, observation. And so what happened is that uh, the university immediately issued a statement saying that we have nothing to do with the trip. The professor did it without our consent and we have nothing to do with it. So that was bad. And to issue such a statement, nobody asked them to issue that statement. And uh, so and then the syndicate of professors and workers at, uh, at, uh, at the university issued a statement saying that uh, they fired me from my post 
because what I did was shameful. And I was not part of that syndicate. So I, I sent them a message. I said, how can you fire me from something I'm not a member of? Because I don't believe anyway that I had problems with that before because it was a syndicate in, uh, including professors and workers and employees. And I thought, you know, there the are three fact groups and we don't share the same uh, goals or the same. So we had each should have their syndicate. So I never joined it, but yet I found myself being fired from it. And then nine student unions issued a statement saying that uh, what, uh, what I did and by name, what I did was normalization and normalization is treason. And so I committed treason. And then they made demonstrations on campus and uh, had these students go to my offices, uh, trash them and, uh, uh, and then leave with my secretary a, a death threat letter if I come back to the university. So when I came back and I saw all that uh, uproar, uh, I, uh, uh, there was no other option for me but to resign from my post. So the president, in order to cover the university, called me to me for a meeting. And then I went and met him. And he said that, um, uh, why did you resign? And uh, I said, you, you don't see the situation around you. Uh, you, you let me down because you, uh, I, what I did is academic freedom. I did, I want to teach the students and this is, something about knowledge, about learning, about education. And he said that I am under pressure from outside university, uh, whether it is Fatah or the PA or the all the parties. And some of the radical parties have threatened, if you come back to the university, that they will come and kill you. I would said, I will give you protection on campus. But once your car leaves campus, I cannot give you any protection. So my answer was, I don't need your protection on campus or outside campus. What I need you to do is to say that what I did is not treason that, or don't mention treason, to say that this is academic freedom and that what I did is to expand knowledge of students. And they said, I'm sorry, but I cannot do that. And so for a few days later, he, he did not have the courtesy to send me his acceptance of my resignation because I sent him my resignation to him because I was also the, the director of the libraries. So my connection was directly with him. So he asked an employee officer to send me a letter to say that uh, we have accepted, the university has accepted your, uh, your uh, uh, resignation. So a few, and also, you know, there was a lot of pressure outside. The media, you know, the teachers uh, started to write even against me, saying that I pressured the students and uh, I uh, uh, promised the students, I will, every student who will go, I will give him an A. And so the students who went, uh, went to the teachers one by one at two in the morning to tell them that we are not puppets. We are, we are men. We decide for women. We decide for ourselves. And we went because we wanted to win, not because he pressured them. And then they went to the president and pressured them in order for him to uh, take back the acceptance of the resignation. But he said, but he refused to do that. And so two of them wrote letters. One wrote a letter in Arabic defending the trip. And another student wrote a letter in the Atlantic in English to defend the trip. So, um, and also they wrote on Facebook about the trip. We collected their letters that they have written about that in a book that we published called The Teaching Empathy and Reconciliation in this book. Mm -hmm. I'll be more than glad to send it to you free uh, if you are interested to have a copy of it. 
just uh, um, let us know and uh, we will try to provide it for you. But um, in the book, it is divided into four sections. The first section talks about professors who went and or professors talking about reconciliation and theory. The second part talks about the trip itself and what the media said about it. The third talks about the student reaction. And uh, then the fourth, it is uh, photos of uh, what happened. And so, and this was you know, what happened with that. Uh, right. when, when I used to be asked about the what happened, I used to say what you would have heard from CNN, Amanpour, that I wrote on my post that if I will have the chance to go, I we will do it. We will do it. And so that's where uh, that led to torching my car. And uh, torching the car was also, it was not that they came and torched it at night, that they came two days before. And then they put glue within the motor of the car so that once it heats up, it will explode. Uh, and so we were, I was in Italy at the time when they did that. And my brother came and said, did you, did you park your car next to a carpenter? I said, why? He came to pick me up from the airport and we were driving back. And he said, because I noticed that on the car, there is so much glue. And I told them, no, I did not. So by the time we came, uh, we were very lucky that the car did not heat because it was snowing. And so it was cold. And so we parked the car at 11 at night, they came and they spilled all the area with gas and, uh, and even under the car and around the whole parking area in order for, if we come out to, to try to uh, put the put the fire off, then we will be met with the fire around it. Mm. It took uh, the uh, when the uh, uh, fire extinguisher extinguisher came when the fire brigade came. It took them more than three hours trying to put down the fire. Wow! A big message that they have sent. Uh, so after that, I will get threat messages. And so my friend Robert Satloff offered me, uh, for me to go and uh, work as a fellow, Western fellow at the Washington Institute. So I went there for two years. And uh, after that, although I could have stayed in the United States, but I decided to come back to finish my work with the, uh, with the Wasatiya uh, in promoting Wasatiya. And uh, also we started a program at uh, uh, the Euro Europa University in Flensburg, which is a PhD program uh, called the uh, European Wasatia uh, program, which to which I donated funding for it, 35,000 euros. So mm -hmm. that as money uh, to have it uh, started. And uh, so we are, we were also we are also hoping to raise funds for it, and uh, the idea there is that to have Israelis, Palestinians, Arabs from the Gulf, Arabs from North Africa, uh, uh, Muslims from Afghanistan or Pakistan, all of them to meet there and to study together uh, reconciliation, peace, and um, hopefully that we will be able to raise funds for these students that we can go on with this project. Wow. Well, that's quite a story. Um, I wanted to get into some of these uh, questions of you of uh, uh, more modern day, but uh, <laughs> it, it's like, although I'm, very familiar with the story. I, it, it still takes my breath away, the whole thought of what you went through. Um, but to move on, um, 
do you think the situation today is better or worse between Israelis and Palestinians? Oh, and before you answer, if you have uh, some questions, uh, please put them into the chat box. I, I saw some, but uh, if you could start with that, um, uh, do you think the situation today is better or worse between Israelis and Palestinians? I think it's worse because um, the, uh, within the Palestinian society, the BDS have uh, gained much ground. And uh, so a normalization has become uh, uh, a label that they, they put on other people who are working for peace. And so anti-normalization is uh, uh, getting uh, stronger and stronger every day, particularly with the uh, expansion of expropriation of land and uh, with the Trump policies uh, regarding uh, Jerusalem, regarding support of Israel, regarding... So within the Palestinian uh, society, that led to uh, solidifying the anti-peace camp. And uh, so, it, uh, yeah, the question always that is being raised is how can moderation uh, end occupation? And uh, to me, uh, it's, uh, it's a simple answer because uh, I would tell them that um, if we promote the culture within the Palestinian community, then that will ensure again the peace camp within Israel. And uh, empowering the peace camp within Israel is uh, a must in order uh, to build bridges with the Israelis. Because without Israeli support and without a peace camp within Israel, it is very difficult really to, uh, to end the occupation or to... And uh, using force is not the answer. And so as a result, this is part of the problem that we have. And um, we are hoping that the elections, that upcoming election, will bring new leadership and, uh, uh, to the Palestinians. I don't know about the Israelis, but uh, we hope that it will uh, bring, because the stagnant situation in the Palestinian, uh, in Palestine, uh, and the corona, uh, and the failure to deal with the corona and the uh, deteriorating economic condition uh, is, uh, will force people to vote the present government out. Um, speaking of corona, um, certainly um, Israel uh, had offered and uh, the PA uh, didn't want vaccinations from Israel, um, but they have begun, I understand, to vaccinate the workers who work in Israel. Um, as far as the rest of the world, they all think that, that Israel is just ignoring the Palestinians, yet they aren't in, in the Palestinians are, have other leaders that are supposed to be handling the vaccinations. Can, can you talk about your, your viewpoint of who should be vaccinating the Palestinians and, and, and what is going wrong with that whole situation? What's going wrong with it is the culture that the people, the Palestinians, think that this is a conspiracy by Bill Gates and that is a conspiracy and uh, there is uh, so and there is no uh, there is no uh, corona and uh, so they fail to and also we inherited from Arafat and Abbas a very weak uh, healthcare system and so uh, and because they couldn't handle it, the Palestinian Authority ignored it, put their head in the sand. And so uh, they didn't uh, really uh, uh, do much to fight it. Now they want to blame the Israelis for it. 
but um, the problem is uh, they failed to uh, from the beginning. And there came a time when it started to spread. They uh, cl made closures, but within the culture, they allowed they allowed uh, they allowed. Uh, for instance, if there is uh, a wedding, they are out the gathering, the, and the, they never enforce people to wear uh, masks or to have uh, to distance themselves. And so the epidemics uh, spread. The minister, who knows nothing about it, and uh, they didn't have experience to deal with it, instead of benefiting from this. Israeli experience, they closed the, themselves within the Palestinian territories. And unfortunately, the Palestinians are paying the price. Now the hospitals cannot uh, take care when, when somebody is sick, he stays home because the hospital does not. And uh, even when they, when they were sick, I was asking a friend of mine in Ramallah who got sick with the corona, are you in a hospital? She said, no, I'm at home. Are you taking any medicine? No. Is there any doctor seeing you? No. So what are you doing? Just waiting at home to see what, whether this will kill her or will, and she will survive. So, and, and so I don't believe and this is, the Israelis, what they are doing now is that they are vaccinating workers and laborers coming to Israel. And so, that is uh, that that should be done because these people cannot move from to Israel and go back and uh, if they want to accept if they have the uh, corona vaccination but um, the Palestinians should uh, and Israelis I wrote about that uh, six months ago that they should and this is a time for them to cooperate together and this is an opportunity for them to cooperate together. I mean, they have the security cooperation, but this is more important in the sense that this virus does not know borders and it could move from one to the other. So it is in the best interest of Israel and the PA to cooperate on this, but they would refuse to do that. So basically, you know, it's a, it is a matter of uh, uh, enmity that never ceases to stop even when it has to do with an epidemic. Certainly the uh, Palestinians reacted to the Abraham Accords. Uh, Let me add also. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Also, it's very interesting that in Israel, in Jerusalem, for instance, the I, by the Jerusalem, I, Arab, um, and through uh, um, you had it, I was able to go and get my vaccination. Mm -hmm. And uh, But many Jerusalemites, uh, Arabs, refuse to do so because they still think in terms of conspiracy. So the Israelis will send vaccinations to the Arab center. And the Arab centers do not use them because no Palestinian or very few Palestinians are going there. And so now, that Israel is, uh, will be putting pressure on everybody to be vaccinated. Some of them are going back to be vaccinated. But be before that, many of them would say, we need to wait and see. Maybe this vaccination is not, is not the answer or let us wait and see. Or that it is a, they don't believe that there is an epidemic. They go to pray, they go to mosques, to restaurants, to uh, but uh, but hopefully that eventually that um, this culture will change. Well, I started to ask you about the Abraham Accords and how the Palestinian people, what they thought of it, um, which in the papers at least, it seems more and more as a abandonment of them. But uh, could you talk about that? Another, this is another area where we had collision with the PA because um, I uh, criticized the uh, uh, Mahmoud Abdi, PA president policy regarding 
the uh, normalization. We should not have uh, blamed the Arabs for the normalization with Israel. First, we started this normalization ourselves. And yes, Egypt started it before us, but we started it in uh, the Oslo Accord in 1993. And we have been doing it since 1995. So for 25 years, for 25 years, we have been normalizing, we've been normalizing with Israel. Now, the Arabs in, two, in the Arab summit, they wanted to do a collective uh, bargaining, but it did not work. The Israelis did not accept it. And, and then within the Arab world, it did not go through. And so it did not work. Now, they want, to start, they want to start another way of dealing with it, which is one-to-one, -one, rather than collective package, to have it on one-to-one. -one. And so I believe, maybe I'm wrong, but I believe that the PA dealt with it totally wrong in the sense of attacking the Arab countries who normalized. What they should have done is basically to see things from the point of view of the Arab government, who are fearing Iran more than they fear. And so they are worried about the Iranian threat to their security and to their country and to their status more than Israeli. Because with Israel, we can deal with the United States. Both of them are allies of the United States. So within that, there, there is no problem with Israel. They have no problem with Israel. Now, they were waiting for 25 years for the Palestinians also to, to make initiatives. They, they lost initiatives under the Obama administration. And Obama came to, to, to Ramallah to meet Abbas, and Abbas set him down. And all, and Obama had a vision about peace, and we, we missed it. So basically, they, with Trump, uh, they, you know, they, there was not much they could do because Trump took, took it all the way to the other side. Uh, but even then, even with Trump, they should not have colla coll went on a collision course with a superpower like the United States. They could have uh, been able to, to use the diplomacy rather than do it like the Venezuela way to go on a crash course. They could have, any you know, regarding Jerusalem, mm. you know, yes. them, whether Trump declares it or not, is divided. You have more than 450,000 Palestinians living in Jerusalem. And what is United Jerusalem? What do you want to do with them? And so, you know, even when Trump said about Jerusalem as capital, he never, I, I never heard him say United Jerusalem. He said Jerusalem. Correct. So we have done like what the, what the what the Israelis or the international did in 1967, whether it is the withdrawal from territories or withdrawal from the territories. We could have said the same thing. We could have said Trump never said the United Jerusalem. So East Jerusalem is still uh, any ours to keep. It. So this is part of. And instead of uh, trying to be diplomatic, they were trying to go into a collision course to win popularity among the masses. Rather than the masses, they allowed the masses to be. And so this was part of the problem that we have had. And so instead of using the Arab countries that had normalized this relation with Israel as bridges between them and Israel, like what, ha like what is happening between Hamas and Egypt, that Hamas uses Egypt as a bridge to Israel. And Egypt interferes whenever there are problems with Hamas in order to bring down the tension. Okay, we could have done the same. We could have done, instead of going on a clash course with the Arab with those Arab countries who have been funding us for, for years since the Nakba, and who have given us all their support since the Nakba. 
for us to go and fight against them and to say they are traitors, betrayed us, and they uh, and put the knife in our back and all that, stabbed us in the back. That's not the way. That's not how it should have been. And I think it was a big catastrophe for us to do that. But yet, not much one can do because yeah. and people here do not listen and uh, they do what they want to do. And that's part of the problem. It's not a democratic uh, uh, leadership. It is a one-man leadership. And it's uh, the executive power have usurped the legislative power and the judicial power and put them in one. So there is no legislative council and there is no uh, judiciary that is separate from uh, the uh, executive, from the executive. So I tell people, now you want to vote for a legislative council? What did the, the original, the last legislative council feed? Uh, and you know, what was its purpose? And in 2007, they stopped to meet. And from 2007 till this day, they get their salaries and their benefits, but they don't meet. And the president is doing all the laws. So what is the point of this legislative council? The presidency is a different story because the people run against Abbas, he will lose. And that's why he wanted to make a deal with Hamas, so that Hamas will not run against him because he knows if Hamas runs against him, he will lose. And thinking that he can control the other Fatah uh, leaders. So when the other Fatah leaders like Nasser al-Qudwi said, no, we are going to run against you. And when other independent leaders said that they want to uh, and to, they want to run against also the Fatah list. Now we have something like five, five six lists, major lists that are running against him. So the only way that he could get out of it is to postpone the elections forever and not to go through that elections because if that elections takes place, you know, the independence or those who are running against the Fatah list will surely win. Also, Hamas has a good chance because Hamas is very well organized and very well funded from Iran and from Qatar. And so, and all you need in elections is organization and funding. Once you have those, you are showing. Do Palestinians see a difference between President Trump and President Biden? And do you? Yeah, of course. They, not also, not also regarding the Arab Israeli conflict. But Trump was, uh, uh, he was a madman. He was, <laughs> he was not, and he was not someone, not for us, for the Americans. Look what happened with the epidemic. Look what happened to his policies, his international policies, his allies. He disrupted his all US, that what the US had been building as a leadership within the European countries, within other world as a world leader. He destroyed it and de isolated the United States. So it's not only with the Arab Israeli conflict, with all and with all his policies. It was an isolation iso, uh, isolation policies and and mm -hmm. look what happened with, with the Europeans and he is uh, his and he preferred the Russians over the Europeans. And so uh, it was and uh, it was a sad, I think it was the lowest I thought, American presidency when I was in the States. I think that the Trump admi administration of presidency will be ranked very low within the, within teaching the American presidency. You know, the hundred dollar, hundred million dollar question is in your opinion, what would be the best solution? Two states, one state, something different? What, what do you think would be the best case? I have written uh, what I call, and it is on Facebook. I believe that the one state is not workable. 
because uh, in a one state, either you understand it be an Israeli state, and so it is it controls all other minorities, including the Palestinians, or what the Palestinian want, a Palestinian state that will control the Israelis. So the one state will not work because the Israelis want a homeland and want to have their own identity. The Palestinian on the other side, they want to have their own identity. And that's why I believe in the two-state solution. I don't believe the two-state is, is dead, no. I don't believe that. Because uh, whatever the settlements expropriated of land, this is against not only international law, but against the Oslo Accord, which is uh, sponsored by the United States and signed by Israel. So yeah, this is where the Palestine state is, yeah, it can be established. And then within the two states, Israel and Palestine, then they can have agreements to cooperate, but they don't need to have borders within themselves, like before Oslo. And, uh, and then, so the, board, the borders are not there. Also within the refugees, look, we say in Wasatiya, the right of return, the right is holy, but the return is negotiable. Now, when you, want, when you are talking about the return, you are not talking about the return of hordes of millions of people. Look, be realistic. People are dying in the Mediterranean to reach to Europe. You want to tell me people in Palestinians in Europe they, are, they will rush back to Palestine or to uh, to Ramallah or to Nablus or yani so let us be realistic. I had a friend who came after Oslo. He's an engineer, and then he wanted. You, I took him to a friend of mine who was a contractor, and that guy told him, "How much is your salary?" He said. I will offer you $3,000. He said, Muhammad, I make in the, state, in the States more than $300,000. What will I do with these $36,000? How can, how can I live? Huh? And then he left and went back. So why are we talking about myth mythologies? And let's talk about realities. And so also with regard to Jerusalem, Look, when you when you look at Robert's uh, uh, when you look at Robert's paintings, you will see that Jerusalem is what the Ottomans have surrounded the city with the wall. So that's the religious Jerusalem, where when you talk about Jerusalem as attached by Christians, Muslims, and Jews, we are talking about the old city. Outside the old city, hundred years ago, there was nothing. There wasn't a single building. And people used to live inside the wall because they were afraid to be robbed by tribes that would come outside the wall. So here, Jerusalem is two Jerusalems. There is the religious city, and there is the administrative and the municipal city. The municipal city, who cares about it? And if you have land there, you have it. And uh, so it is east and west. Now, the holy city, is there inside the city, can be like Vatican, can be done Muslims, Christian, Jews who can take care of it and uh, make it international, including Israelis and Palestinians and Saudis and Jordanians and others you know, to represent Islam, Christianity, Judaism. So in this way, you know, Jerusalem you know, is not really a big issue. You know, and it's not, none of those issues uh, are problematic. They are solvable if there is a solution, if there is a will to have a solution. But the politicians don't have the will. They like the status quo. The right-wing government in Israel think that they can live and make de facto by expropriating the land illegally. And so they don't want, they want the status quo to, to build as much. I can sue them 50 years later, for every land, they, for every meter they took, look, look at the painting that was in Europe, and then a Jewish family 
uh, sued and got it back, a painting. Huh? Can't I, I can bring the Oslo Accords and say, you signed here on this land and then you expropriated it. So you are the one who is making it illegal. Also with the settlements, why not have, and why not, if there are legitimate settlements, we can include them within the state of Palestine. We have Arabs in Israel and we can have Jews in Palestine and then they can have Jewish laws. So you can find ways to solve problems if you want to solve problems. But if you don't, then this is the problem. Wow. The problem is that there is no problem. Yeah, this is the problem. <laughs> I'm looking for a problem. I can't find a problem, except people trying to make problems because they benefit from the status quo. The PA leadership benefit from the status quo. And the Israeli leaders and right-wing leaders create this fear from the Palestinians. And they caught Palestinians who say things in desperation. And then they say, there is no partner. There is a partner. We are partners. And I know Israelis who are partners. And so, but we want to expand the number of people within both camps so that we become a majority. But there are people in Israel and people in Palestine and they are a majority, but they are silent and we want them to be vocal. I agree with you there. Well, I could ask you questions all night long, but uh, thanks so much, Professor Dijani, for sharing your knowledge with us. It just was really very, very insightful, and I really appreciate it. We've got some interesting guests in the weeks ahead. Next week, I'll be interviewing Roz Konez. I'm especially excited to speak with her because she's an Israeli and runs a program of Israeli and Palestinian high school students with another Palestinian instructor in the West Bank. This is the next generation and the more they have the ability to interact with one another, the better for everyone's future. To our listeners today and those listening to the recording later, thank you. And may you live in peace, shalom, and salam. Mm -hmm.